What's up everybody, this is Jumma Jump Fair Innovations and I'm so excited to bring you today's video. So today I'm going to show you how you can prove that the derivative of sine x is in fact cos of x. Now in a previous video we used the limit definition of a derivative to show that the derivative of e to the power of x was in fact itself. And if you haven't checked that one out, do make sure you do because there's a lot of content in there that I know you're going to love and enjoy. Also, in another previous video, I showed you the basic fundamentals of using the limit definition of a derivative. So today, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the limit definition of a derivative itself, as opposed to implementing trigonomic functions to, to work out or to prove rather the derivative of a trigonomic function. In this case, we're using sine of x. So our limit definition is given to us as the formula of the derivative of function x is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of function x plus h minus function x all divided by h. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to be able to substitute our function into this equation to solve. Now function x is just going to be the derivative that we're trying to solve, which in this case is going to be sine of x. So we just put that in where we would have function x. And function x plus h is simply just wherever we see an x value, we add a h to it. So we've got sine of x. So function x plus h is just going to be sine x plus h. And now what we're going to do is we're going to have to use one of our trigonomic identities, which is when we have sine and two, um, two additions within its angle. So let's say we have sine of the angle n plus m, where n and m are just any real number. What we do is, all we simply do is, is we can expand this out. So sine n plus m will give us sine of n multiplied by cos of m plus sine of m multiplied by cos of n. And we can actually use this because we can see that our sine of x plus h is in this same form. So we can just substitute the n's and the m's. So sine of x plus h is going to give us sine of x multiplied by cos of h plus sine of h multiplied by cos of x. And now we plug all this in back into our formula. Because remember, in previous video, I talked about how the h part will be dealt with in regards to the limit. So we can plug this in, and it's going to give us as the limit, as the limit h approaches 0, is going to be have the fraction of sine of x multiplied by cos h plus sine of h multiplied by cos of x minus sine of x all over the fraction of h. So the first thing we're going to do is, is we're going to see if we can find some like terms. Well, I can notice in my fraction that I've actually got sine of x in two parts. I've got sine of x multiplying cos of h, and I've also got sine of x as a negative at the end. So that really means sine of x multiplied by negative 1. So I can put these together and, and that way then we can make our fraction seem a, look, look a little bit nicer and be a little bit more simpler for us to solve. So if we put our like terms together, in this case our sine of x, so sine of x multiplied by cos of h is just sine x multiplied by cos of h, and negative sine x is sine of x multiplied by negative 1. So I can put this into a bracket. So our now function is going to read that the limit as h approaches 0 of sine of x multiplied by the bracket of cos h minus 1, or close bracket, plus sine of h multiplied by cos of x, all divided by h. Remember, I can't do anything about the sine h cos x because that doesn't have a sine x in it, so that's going to stay as its own entity for now. Now, also, what we know about uh, fraction additional rules is that they have to have the same denominator if you're going to add or subtract, right? So we can actually break this apart because we've got sine of x multiplied by the bracket of cos h minus 1 plus sine of h multiplied by cos of x. So these are two numbers. So it's just like if you had, say for example, if you had uh, 1 over 4 plus 3 over 4, you would, you would have the denominator remain the same and you would add them together and that would give you 4 over 4 or 1. But you could also break them apart, couldn't you? You could go from 4 over 4 and you could break it to read 1 over 4 plus 3 over 4. It means the same thing. So we're actually going to do this right now so we can separate it to try and make it a bit nicer for us. So we've got our, our sine of x uh, multiplying its bracket on one limit and we've got another limit representing the parts that doesn't have a sine x in it. 
And the great thing about limits are is that they they have additive properties. So I can separate the fractions like this, and it will still give me the same answer. I don't have to have to treat it any differently. So I can find the limit of one fraction and add it to the limit of the other fraction, and it'll still give me the same answer as if I did it all in one go. So that's going to now give us the function of our equaling to the, the derivative function equaling to the limit as h approaches zero of sine of x multiplied by cos of h minus one, all over the over h plus the limit as h approaches zero of sine of h multiplied by cos x, all divided by h. Now, the values in the limit doesn't change, we're just simply separating them as two fractions. So now, when we look at it, we're looking at it as a limit as a h approaches zero. Well, what this is talking about is, is that if we're looking from the negative or the positive direction and we get closer and closer and closer to zero, when we're put, subbing in our value of h, what our answer is going to tend towards. So because this is the case, if we have, say, sine of x, that's not going to change depending on what value of h is. If sine of x is equal to, let's say, pi, for example, it doesn't matter what I do to the cos h part or the derivative by h, it's not going to change what sine of x is. Sine of x is just going to be a number that we're multiplying this fraction to. So what I can actually do is I can actually take this out of the the limit fraction and just multiply it as I would say if it was like a number like 10 or 12. And I can do this as well for the other fraction when I'm talking about cos of x because it's the same principle. It's only going to be simply a coefficient multiplier of whatever our limit fraction gives us. So now this is going to read as the when we our formula is going to read now as sine of x all multiplied by the limit as h approaches zero of cos h minus one all over h plus cos of x multiplied by the limit as h approaches zero of sine of h all over h. So now we've actually got two very famous limits in mathematics, um, but I'm not going to take those as, as the proofs because that's a little bit sort of circular reasoning to, to use proofs that have all, that come from this. But you may have seen these limits before because, as I said, they are quite famous, especially when we're dealing with trigonometric functions. But if I put it into a graph or I use values of, of h getting closer and closer and closer to zero from the negative and the positive side, we can see where our, our fraction tends towards. So let's try cos of h minus 1 all divided by h. Well, as we can see from our values and also from our graph, that the values are getting closer and closer to zero every time. So we come to the conclusion that the limit as h approaches zero of cos h minus one divided by h is going to tend towards zero. So that's the answer, so that's the number that we'll be subbing in for that limit. Now, if we look at our other one, the limit as h approaches zero of sine of h divided by h, we can see from our graph and we can also see from our numerical values as as our numbers of h get closer and closer to zero from both the positive and the negative direction, we can see that this limit tends towards one. So we can say that the limit as h approaches zero of sine of h divided by h will tend towards one. So this is the number now that we'll sub in for our other part of our limit. So subbing this in now, after all that mathematics, we can now get to the nice part where we finally get to our answer. So subbing in for zero where we had the limit of cos h minus one over h it's, and we've also subbing in where we have the limit as h approaches zero of sine h over h equaling one our equation now is going to read sine x multiplied by zero plus cos of x multiplied by one and anything multiplied by zero is going to give me zero and anything multiplied by one is going to give me itself so cos x multiplied by one will give me cos x and sine of x multiplied by zero will give me zero. So now this is going to read as zero plus cos of x, and anything plus zero is just itself. So zero plus cos of x is in fact cos of x. So there we have it. We've shown now that the derivative of sine of x is in fact cos of x. And you can actually use this same technique to show that the derivative of cos x is in fact negative sine x. The only difference that you will be using here is the, uh, 
just the trigonomic identity will be cos of n plus n instead of sine of n plus n. But it's the same process. So give it a go yourself. See if you can get to the derivative of cos x being negative sine x. But thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Hopefully now you can use the limit definition of a derivative with trigonomic functions. But always stay safe, be kind to one another. And if you enjoyed the video today, do make sure you like it. Do hit, the, uh, do hit that subscribe button if you love my videos. And also, if you do have any other questions or comments that you would like to give me, please leave a comment below because I absolutely love all the questions and all the feedback that I get. But always, stay safe, be kind to one another, and I'll see you next time.